Welcome back to On The Move with Victor Xi. This is Victor Xi. It is Thursday, January 19th, and I am coming to you live from Los Angeles again. Today, we are going to be talking about the Republican Party because every day it seems to be getting crazier and more extreme. This week, we saw Kevin McCarthy unveil some key committee assignments, including the Oversight Committee, Homeland Security Committee. And some of the people who are on those committees are a bit concerning, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was kicked off the committee in 2021 for her just ridiculous claims about 9-11, which she later walked back. But she is someone who is on both the Oversight and Homeland Security Committees. We'll talk about that, what that all means for democracy and also the functioning of Congress, and whether or not we can ever go back to conservative traditional principles. Um, And I'm really glad to be joined by Essie Cup, uh, who I think is the perfect person to talk about all of this. I'm sure you've seen her on CNN or have read her columns in the New York Daily News. Um, She's an essential voice in this effort to restore sanity to the Republican Party. Um, Essie, it's so great to see you, and thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's It's so crazy to hear you say restoring sanity. I mean, I just can't (laughs) believe we're here, but here we are. (laughs) I know. You know, where to begin with the Republican Party? I feel like every time I I couldn't expect less from the Republican Party, they proved me wrong. And I'm curious for you, as a lifelong Republican, based off of what we saw just a couple of weeks ago with the vote for Kevin McCarthy becoming speaker, did you ever think you would witness something like that? Um, And what did that moment tell you about the state of the Republican Party? Well, um, I wasn't surprised he had a hard time um, getting nominated because I know this Republican House. Um, Mm -hmm. They're disruptors. And that actually makes them sound good um, and noble. They're destructors. I mean, they want to destroy, um, you know, the party, democracy. They want to they want to tear it down. Um, And I guess maybe start over with something that they like better. Um, but so I wasn't surprised that it was messy and look, it's been messy before. Um, but I was surprised at how everyone ended up caving in the end, including McCarthy. I mean, he mm-hmm. is probably one of the weakest speakers we've ever had. Cause it just takes like one guy to say, right. we want him right. gone. He conceded to that, which is mind blowing. And in the end, the Gates crowd, um, caved. Mm-hmm. So after all of that, after all the shenanigans and the the disrupting, what does everyone have to show for it? I'm I'm yeah. not really sure actually what what everyone ended up winning out of that, and I don't expect Kevin McCarthy will be speaker for very long. Yeah, I mean, you know, you wrote you wrote a great um, column in the New York Daily News yesterday. I want to ask you about some of the things that the Republicans have done as the majority now in, in the House. And I want to focus first on policy. And yesterday you wrote um, in, in your column, while conservative leaders before him had pushed for austerity, fiscal responsibility, free trade, and the economic optimism of rising tides, Trump favored reckless spending, exploding the debt and deficit, trade protectionism, and the economic pessimism of grievance politics. And we're seeing that play out now because this morning um, Janet Yellen sent this letter to Kevin McCarthy saying that they've reached the debt ceiling. And um, I read David Jolly yesterday said that apparently 25% percent of the entire national debt was accumulated under um, Trump. And so I'm wondering if you can pinpoint anything um, in the Republican Party right now that seems to indicate that they are returning to maybe traditional Republican principles or, or policies. Well, sure. Now that Trump's out and they have control of the House, they're talking about debt and deficit again. Um, they had completely mm-hmm. forgotten it for the four years that Trump was president. And it's wild because I, I've known Mike Pence a long time and I did a long interview with him many years ago when he was just governor of Indiana. And he was like, he was a deficit hawk. The mm-hmm. most mm-hmm. the most concerned about the def, debt and deficit it, it, inside the Republican Party at the time. And Trump came in, didn't care about it. And so Mike Pence didn't care about it suddenly. Oh. And Republicans didn't care about it. And for conservatives like me, that's why we got into the, the party because this was the party of austerity, fiscal responsibility, star of the beast, limited government. That was the appeal. So to jettison all of that in favor of culture wars garbage um, has been obviously disappointing and disorienting. But, you know, the Republican Party of today is nothing if not craven. And so I'm sure they'll, you know, they'll suddenly remember the things that they might have cared about before if they think that it's politically advantageous to them. 
Yeah. I mean, do you think this is all, perf- I mean, you mentioned that they're, they're talking about deficit and, and the debt ceiling now. I mean, is this all performative considering what we saw, like you said, over the past four years of Trump, where they threw away all of those principles? Well, I don't know what isn't performative about yeah, the party right, now. Right. Even, I mean, even if you look at an issue like Roe, which is important to a lot of conservatives and mm-hmm. um, a lot of folks in the pro-life community, banning all abortion, banning access to abortion, which is essentially what Texas did, isn't even popular among Republicans. It yeah, isn't yeah. even popular in Texas. 13% of Texans believe that abortion should be banned. So who are they doing this for if not a performance? They're not even really doing it for their own constituents. So whether it's book bans or abortion bans or, um, you know, getting angry at Sesame Street, whatever they're doing and concerning themselves with at the time, I think is almost entirely performance. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think most of these people care all that much about policy and, and good governance. Yeah. Well, I mean, in that same vein, uh, I mentioned at the outset, the committee assignments, and and I want to ask you about that because, you know, the majority of the American people say that they don't consider investigating President Biden and Democrats as their top priority. But yet we've seen that become the top priority for Republicans right now. Um, we've seen people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert get uh, assignments on the House Oversight Committee. Jim Jordan is chairing this um, subcommittee uh about the weaponization of government. And so I'm wondering, you know, what should we be making of these committees? And, and, you know, it's so confusing to me because they do things that are so apparently against their self-interest. Who does this benefit? I mean, the Republican Party base is shrinking. I mean, who who is going to find this popular? Well, that's the thing. You hit on it. It's uh, the, the Republican base is shrinking. Uh, but it's also condensing and getting more pure right? So it's small, but they all believe in the same stuff now. We used to be a big 10 with wings of the party. There's no wings. Mm -hmm. Um, And what Trump did, what what was, I think his, one of his main signatures was that he brought in this politics of revenge. The policy didn't matter. The principles didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was quote unquote conservative or not. Revenge was the point in some cases, And that then became important to his voters. So the investigations are what Republican voters want. It's not what most people in the country want, but it's absolutely what the base voters want above all else. I mean, um, talk about putting, you know, their interests on the sideline. Um, Things like their, you know, their taxes, what's happening at their local school board, what's happening at their local sanitation board, that's what's important. Yeah. But for a lot of Republican base voters, this revenge is leading the way. And so policies that are introduced now, like the don't say gay bill, other stuff coming out of Florida are punitive, purely mm-hmm. punitive. They don't have real policy underneath them. They're really just mean because the cruelty is yeah. the point. Do you think voters are beginning to understand this? I mean, one of my biggest concerns is that, you know, despite all of this, that 30%, that 40% that Trump still maintains is going to believe in whatever the Republican Party and Trump says and does. But I mean, are are we reaching a point where even what they're doing now is starting to dissuade Republicans who might be in that camp? Look, I think you're able to get some off the, the edges, some of the more moderate Republicans or even some some, you know, quote unquote, far right Republicans who are kind of just sick of the chaos. Yeah, yeah. that's that's possible. But your 30 to 40 percent, I think, is actually overstating. I think the base is down to 25 hmm. oh, wow. percent okay. of people in this country identify themselves as Republican. It's bigger uh-huh. for conservative and bigger for, you know, moderate, independent. But Republican, I think the last Pew or, or Gallup I checked was like down to 25 percent. But that 25 percent is almost unreachable for anyone else. And so it's, you know, I'm asked all the time, who's the candidate that could come along and maybe get Democrat, Democratic votes and Republican votes, you know, for president. Not, that person does not exist because 25% is still a sizable voting block that you need. You can't, you can't get elected without that 25% or at least some of it. So, um, you know, they're small, but they are potent and they are completely aligned in lockstep.
Mm -hmm. So I, I want to ask you about the rising generation of Republicans and whether or not you think there's anything in store for them. I mean, you enter the Republican Party when there was still sanity and when there was actual policy. But for any young person now who's thinking of joining the Republican Party, I mean, what would you say to them about the current state of the party and what it has to offer them? Because to me, it seems like a lot of the Republicans right now, especially after the midterm elections, are kind of dunking on Gen Z or dunking on young people. And so is there anything left for young people in this party right now? No. And the young people that the Republican Party are attracting, and, and, and it is attracting young people, are attracted to like the Charlie Kirk yeah, right. wing, right? Like the nationalist, in some cases, white pride, in some mm -hmm. cases, anti-Semitic, like the Proud Boys. I mean, that's what's drawing them in. And that should be scary to the Republican Party, but they don't seem to mind. They'll take votes anywhere they can get it. Um, and for the rest of young people, what what is what are they offering? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I used to be able to point to policies because, you know, Republicans have always had a tough time getting younger voters. Um, you know, I say Democrats took them for granted. Republicans ignored them altogether. Yeah. But I used to be able to point to policies that I thought were appealing to young people, right? Young people are entrepreneurial. Well, you know, Republicans were the party of deregulation, right? And making small businesses um, thrive. Uh, the tax policy, young people are punished because they don't have homes, because they're not married. Well, good for them. They saw their parents go through a housing crisis. Um, so they're, they're punished by the tax code for making good decisions. That's real stuff. Young people might not buy it in the end, but that's real stuff I could offer. Mm -hmm. I don't know what policies Republicans as a party are trying to offer to young people. I, I'm not sure they care anymore because, yeah. again, they're only talking to the the, the, the voters they already have. Right. They're not right. interested in growing the tent. In fact, they're kicking people out. They're kicking good conservatives like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney out of the party. Right. So I don't think they want young voters and I, I assume the feelings mutual but i hope one day the party gets back to identifying policies that are good mm -hmm. for everyone mm -hmm. including young people i totally agree I, in the remaining time that we have left i just want to quickly ask you about 2024 um trump seems to be amping up his campaign team and thinking about returning to social media which is uh, a terrifying reality but <laughs> i'm wondering how big of a chance does trump have right now in securing the nomination and um I'm wondering also what advice do you have for President Biden and Democrats ahead of 2024 yeah. in terms of messaging and how they should be um talking about things. Look, 20, 2024 is going to be messy. Yeah. Um Trump definitely has a chance of getting the nomination. Like definitely. Mm -hmm. I don't think he has a chance of winning, which is why Republicans should stop backing him. He loses. That's what he does. Um and you know, I'm not really sure who can get all of his voters on the right. So I think he has a great shot at, at winning the nomination. Um, he, he doesn't seem to be taking it seriously as of yet, but, you know, I'm sure he'll kick it into high gear. For Biden, look, Biden has every right to run again. He has earned it. Absolutely. But I wish he weren't. I really wish Democrats would offer a strong contrast to whomever we put up. And Joe Biden isn't a voice of the future. Um, you know, he was a transitional president, not a transformational one. And that's OK. Democrats don't need to be embarrassed by that. He got the job done, um, you know, in more ways than one. But I think Democrats should start looking forward and past the Pelosi's and the Biden's and um, on to a younger generation. They seem real unwilling to do that yet. And um, I think that's just prolonging pain. I'm not sure, you know, Biden's going to be in a strong position in 2024. Yeah, I know there are a bunch of calls, especially among young people that, you know, President Biden has done his job really well. But yeah. there is, I think, this appetite for a younger generation to take the helm because there's just something about, I think, President Biden, no matter what he does, he's not really able to reach young people because I think there's just a big disconnect. And so to see a fresh voice in the party, I think, is important. And uh, we'll see how long that takes. Hopefully, if not 2024, 2028. Yeah. I guess Biden will be able to run then. Um, but SE Cup, this was so interesting. And I always learn something when I talk to you. Thank you so much for joining and helping us make sense of this craziness.
Well, and thanks, Victor, for doing what you do and bringing politics to young people, because what we don't want is for all of you to disengage. What mm -hmm. we don't want is for all of you to say, politics is garbage. I'm going to, you know, watch TV or be with my family or work on my job, you know, and forget it all. Yeah. So we need you all to be engaged. And I'm really glad that you're making all of this make sense. Oh, for young thank people. you so much. I, I think of I think of my AP government teacher who once told his classroom that we should all be living the civics lifestyle. That no matter what, small or big, politics has a role in our life. And so um, I, I'm I'm grateful for your kind words and and glad I can be a part of this uh, effort to to keep politics in young people's lives. Yeah, you're doing a good thing. Thanks so much. Bye, see. Well, let's get into some of the news of the day in the remaining time that we have left. Um, first, like I mentioned uh, on the podcast, Janet Yellen this morning, the Treasury Secretary, sent a letter to Kevin McCarthy as well as congressional leadership basically saying that we've hit our debt ceiling. This is the first time that she's had to uh, take extraordinary measures to keep the government open. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about who is to blame. And to me, the Republican Party has a huge responsibility about this. I mentioned in the episode that yesterday I saw this jaw-dropping jaw -dropping tweet about how the Republican Party under Trump, it, they cured 25% of the entire national debt under the Trump years. I mean, this is 25% of the entire national debt was accumulated under the Trump years. I mean, it's crazy to think about. And so when we talk about raising the national debt, the Republican Party has a huge responsibility in this. They were part of what created this problem in the first place. And so it's going to take both parties coming together, but Republicans have to understand that the longer they keep this going, the more it's going to hurt American families, the American economy. And I think the American voters are going to pay, be paying attention to this because they're going to feel this directly in their pocketbook and nothing hurts more than, you know, them trying to take away social security or them trying to take away key benefits and raising taxes, which is exactly what they're doing. And so the economy right now is in a state of, uh, you know, really, I think, imbalance right now. And so we'll all be seeing what happens there. Um, next, I also want to touch upon what's happening down in Florida. Uh, Ron DeSantis, we saw uh, over the spring, he instituted, you know, the LGBTQ uh, expression ban in classrooms. He's also uh, tried to ban books like Beloved. And now he also rejected this effort by the College Board to institute AP African American Studies in classrooms. He said that it was unlawful and that it doesn't meet educational standards. Uh, in the state of Florida, which is really confusing considering the fact that he praised Martin Luther King on Monday for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So there's just this wild hypocrisy, but also this growing whitewashing of American history. They are afraid of what happens if young people gain the knowledge. It kind of, you know, someone told me that this kind of reflects what happened during the Vietnam War. There was this really concerted effort to ban and control what students can learn because the government and the and I think people realize that if young people had the knowledge and tools to make sense of the world, that's the most dangerous and and that's what they kind of pose as a threat and because they actually realize what these people are up to. And so it's really concerning and for a lot of young people who I've talked to in Florida, you know, they are going to respond to this. They are fed up with Ron DeSantis. And so um, we'll be keeping an eye on what happens there with uh, how how Floridans and also young people and teachers respond, because I don't think anyone likes their freedom and education controlled in the classroom. So those are the two things I have today. We'll be keeping an eye out on what happens in the House still. And tomorrow we'll have on someone who's actually in the House uh, serving in Pennsylvania, uh, Congresswoman Summer Lee. She is on fire. She's this rising voice speaking of a new generation. I think she's going to have a great political career and also time in the House. And we'll talk about her run, her uh, time in the House so far, what she plans to do, and how she's working with Republicans, if at all. Uh, so stay tuned for that. It'll be at tomorrow, uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, right here on YouTube.com slash Politicon. You don't want to miss that. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode of On the Move. I will see you all tomorrow, and have a great rest of your Thursday.